Good evening, guys. Welcome. Um, I'm going to present this with thank you very much for taking your evening to spend with us to learn about fentanyl, to educate the community, to take what we are going to show you today um, back home, share it with as many people as you can. There are amazing resources in this room. I want to make sure that your answers or your questions are answered and that you have a resource before you walk out this door. So, without further ado, can you please give a hand for our panelists, our professionals here tonight. They have volunteered their time, um, and we want to thank them very much for being here. And if they want to come to the front and have a seat, we would greatly appreciate it. So while they're getting seated, I'm going to just kind of go over what we'll do tonight. Um, they're going to go over and introduce themselves one by one, kind of tell you why they're here, why, they're, why they are a professional on the panel, um, their passion for fentanyl and what it's doing to our community. And they are the ones, if you'll listen really closely, you can decide who you're going to ask your questions to specifically. Um, after they introduce themselves, we'll watch a 20 minute long, 21 and 31 seconds, minute long documentary. It is very emotional. If you feel a certain way during that documentary, please get up. You can walk outside, take a breather. You will not disrupt anyone. The bathrooms are in the back to your right um, if you need to take a bathroom break as well. So we encourage you to feel comfortable. You're in a safe space here tonight. There are a lot of professionals in this room that can help you if in need. So without further ado, I'm going to let Dr. Rojas start us off. I intended to be at the end of the <laughs> No, 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 no. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Julio. My name is Julio Rojas. I'm a psychologist and a licensed alcohol and drug counselor. I'm overwhelmed by the audience tonight. Thank you for being here. I look forward to sharing some knowledge and hopefully some hope. Uh, my name is Drew Laboon. I'm the Director of Admissions and Marketing at Country Road Recovery Center. Uh, we're a 90-day program. Um, we've been <clears throat> touring around myself and Kira and, uh, and Dustin Huckabee at Stages of Recovery. We've been going around and, and sharing these with the public. My experience um, with fentanyl is through use. I'm, I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict in recovery. And I, when I come, I bring that perspective, not only as the recovering alcoholic and drug addict, but also working in this industry on the front lines, taking those phone calls from the loved ones and the addicts um, 24 hours a day. So that's the perspective um, and, and the reason I'm here. Hi, I'm Ann Benson, and I am a, um, I have a master's in social work, and I'm also a parent of a child who has struggled with substances. I have been affiliated with Parents Helping Parents, which is an organization, volunteers supporting other parents who have loved ones struggling with substance use disorder. Uh, I am also a, um, a helpline specialist with Partnership to End Addiction, and I'm on the helpline for that national organization supporting parents who have loved ones struggling. Uh, we have resources as well for uh, parents who have lost children to substance use disorder related causes. So I'm really happy to be here today and um, thank you very much. So it's always start to, it's best to start remarks with some humor, but um, my wife told me that I'm not that funny and I should just skip this part. Um, she said, just tell everybody your name is Judge Stoner and you're in charge of drug court. That's plenty funny. So um, yeah, my name is Ken Stoner. Uh, I'm a district judge in Oklahoma County. I've been, I'm a, I preside over Oklahoma County's drug courts or treatment courts. So we have a drug court, DUI court, we have a veterans treatment court. Uh, we also have a remerge program, which is for women uh, with, with mothers with children that are also prison bound. So, uh, our program serve what we call high risk. That means people that are uh, likely to commit more crimes and also high need. They have a moderate to severe substance use disorder, uh, but uh, they actually are interested in changing their life and, and getting treatment. And so, we have a very highly structured, very rigorous program. It's, it lasts anywhere from 18 to 24 months, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, it's, uh, it's supervised. Uh, we have 10 UAs a month. Uh, you're supervised by uh, probation officers, but we also give our participants a lot of uh, support and encouragement, uh, but also accountability to make changes in their life. And um, 
right now, uh, I preside over programs. We have about 600 people, all of which would be going to prison uh, if it weren't for their programs. And uh, I sought the position of becoming a district judge to be able to do this type of work prior to going on the bench. Uh, I'd been a prosecutor and also had a private practice uh, where my law firm, we specialize in, in serving uh, clients that had addiction issues and mental health issues. And, um, you know, it look, from the outside, I've been around the criminal justice system in Oklahoma uh, for all my life. And even as a former prosecutor, I was thinking there's just, there's got to be a better way that we can do this. And, uh, you know, Oklahoma is the, uh, we'll say the epicenter of the incar incarceration crisis, but I also think that we can be the epicenter of the solution. So I'm really pleased to be in the role I am, very honored uh, to have the, the role that I have, and uh, also honored to be here tonight and to be on this panel. So thank you. My name is Mark Woodward, and I work for the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics. I wear a lot of different hats at the Bureau, but I oversee a lot of our training and education programs, our drug policy. Um, our agency uh, spends a great deal of time across the state of Oklahoma dealing with a lot of different types of drug issues. Our, our headquarters is in Oklahoma City, but we've got uh, district offices in Tulsa, McAllister, Ardmore, Lawton, and Woodward. We work our own drug investigations, but uh, just as importantly, uh, we, we support the, the local police and sheriff's departments around the state when it comes to drug issues in their communities. Uh, and they simply don't, don't have the resources to be able to deal with those, a lot of long-term type of investigations. Um, as I mentioned, I do a lot of drug education. I go into everything from, from into the schools, talking to parents, uh, do a, a lot of mentoring for various groups of, of either addicts in recovery uh, or family members of addicts, and also sit on the state uh, Drug Endangered Children Advisory Board and I'm one of the supervisors for that program. <coughs> Hi, my name is Lisa Carpenter Grant. Um, I became a professional on this panel without my consent, unfortunately. I lost my son three weeks ago to an accidental fentanyl overdose. I was asked if I would come join the panel. I'm grateful that they called. I need, I need something to do because we have to do something about this. We're losing our young people. This is our future. And we have to come together. So that's why I'm here. I got a lot to say about it. <laughs> and thank you so much for reaching out to me and allowing me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. I'm so glad all of y'all are here tonight. Well, this guys is your amazing professional panel here tonight. Um, I want you to watch the video and think about the questions that you might have. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about our community here. Shawnee, Tecumseh, the surrounding communities. Um, it's happening, it's here, it's been here. Um, I have an amazing guy, Deputy Nick Doe, make sure I pronounce that right. He first hand experienced this, and I'm gonna allow him to tell his story briefly, just so y'all get the impact of it being right here in, in your neighborhoods, in your community, and he is right here with y'all saving lives. So without further ado, let's give him a round of applause. He saved the life. So. Thank you. Um, so on April 15th, it was about 1.45 in the morning. I'm on midnight shift. I uh, overheard Shawnee Dispatch react EMS to the west part of the county for a possible overdose. Um, me carrying fentanyl in my patrol unit, I decided to respond. Um, I felt like I could beat the ambulance there. Um, I arrived. While I was in route, dispatch told me that uh, CPR was in progress. When I arrived, um, they had got a pulse back. It was very weak and slow. Um, I checked, it was a young female. She was 18 years old. I checked her pupils. She had fixed pupils, or not fixed pupils, I'm sorry, uh, pinpoint pupils. Um, I realized she was overdosing. They had told me she had taken some Percocet. I had realized she was overdosing and administered Narcan and uh, before EMS had arrived, she 
had started breathing regularly. Her pulse came back, and uh, by the time EMS arrived, she started waking up, and uh, they transported her to the hospital. <coughs> we later found out that that Percocet she had bought off the street was um, cut with fentanyl. So that's, that's about all I have. Thank you. As you know, it would be very, very nerve-wracking to come up here to tell any story, um, to be a professional on the panel, um, to answer questions, and be vulnerable. Um, so we thank you very much, and thank you for being there that evening and saving her life. Um, Narcan saves lives. You're going to learn a little bit about Narcan, and feel free to ask questions to the panel of professionals afterwards as well. But right now, we're going to watch this documentary. It is very triggering for a lot of people, and I can't say that enough. So if you are experiencing anything during this film, please reach out, ask for help. Like I said, there's a bathroom if you need tissues. Um, we can walk outside to get a breather, whatever you need. There are professionals here to help. So without further ado, I'm going to ask the panel of professionals to have a seat while we watch the video so they can enjoy the video as well. Um, and then we're going to turn the lights off so it'll get a little intimate. As a panel of professionals are going to come back up here. I just want to talk a little briefly. So I watched that video. I probably couldn't even tell you how many times now, and I literally cry every single time. And that's because, and Drew can speak to this as well, is um, I personally have lost 36 people since the last week of October. I've been to 18 funerals since the first week of January. Here in Oklahoma, that's what's happening. And so I think our microphone went out, but um, we're doing these to help prevent that. We're doing these to educate the community. We're doing these to provide resources before it gets to that point, before we're attending funerals. Um, a lot of us here tonight work for treatment facilities. We work for resources in the community. Um, we've made a career in our profession, and our passion, and our calling, and our purpose to do just this, and that's to help save lives as much as we can. And so we put together this panel of professionals tonight to hopefully answer any and all questions you have, provide any and all resources that you might need, but to make sure that you leave here tonight with Narcan. Narcan saves lives. Narcan is what Deputy Doe um, provided to that young lady and saved her life that night. This reverses an overdose. We'll talk more in depth about that. Every single booth here tonight should have them. Do not leave this room tonight without taking one, taking two, taking whatever you need, because at the end of the day, we all need this in our car, in our house, um, in our backpacks, wherever um, we can, because you never know when you're gonna, present, gonna be presented with a crisis situation where you're going to have to use it. And right now, it's every single day. It's every single neighborhood, it's every single person. Um, I would like to say, very briefly, and I'll let the panel talk a little bit more about it, but this is not a substance use <coughs> disorder problem. This is all of us. This is our children. Raise your hand in here if you are a parent. Okay. Our children, they're going to school. We all know about peer pressure. We all know about being young and, you know, trying and experimenting and things like that. And the reality of it is, is it's not experimenting anymore. It's one and possibly dead. The reality of it is, is we live in a social media driven world, um, that it is at their fingertips. We don't need to go and find a hookup someplace. All we need is Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, our phones in our hands. We can have it delivered to our front door. They can drop it off in our mailbox. We can go to school and meet a friend. It can be something as, I think I'm taking an Adderall or a Xanax and it is fentanyl. It can be something as I'm going to a party and everyone else did it, so I just tried it. And you're waking up with eight children in your garage overdose because of a party that you had for your daughter. That's the reality that we're facing. And I want to put that out there and I'll let Mark Woodward start us off and tell us how prevalent it is and how much it's changed just in the last couple years um, and what we're facing right now in our community. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you a little bit about just from a law enforcement perspective, what we are seeing here in the state of Oklahoma. And it was mentioned in the video that this is not something new. Uh, we have seen 
fentanyl pressed to look like oxycodone coming into the United States since about 2013. But it really was during the pandemic that there was a lot of factors that came together in, in, in that, that brought the drug trafficking organizations to the point where they started bringing more fentanyl into the United States because of the lack of other types of drugs they were able to get across the border and some of the things they were able to move through cargo ships and through the U.S. mail service, to be honest. But uh, yeah, since 2019 to 2020, we saw 151% increase in fentanyl-related overdoses in Oklahoma. Meth is still our number one killer. We had almost uh, 994 overdoses last year deaths. And the number one drug that showed up in more of those overdoses was, was methamphetamine. But if you look at what category had the highest, the quickest rise, it is fentanyl. Um, as I said, 151% increase. And we're still getting some 2021 autopsy reports. But from 20 to 21, it looks like we may even surpass the 151% increase. We are seeing about 7 to 10 overdoses per night just at the Oklahoma City hospitals, and that does not include all the other facilities around the state of Oklahoma. And our agency gets called on, on almost all of these, and, and our, our number one goal, we have a unit that, that their number one goal is to try to track where did that pill come from. And, what, and ultimately, we know where it came from. It's the drug trafficking organizations out of Mexico that are getting the fentanyl from China, but we're talking about right here on the streets of Oklahoma City and Shawnee and Tecumseh, and where we are finding the majority of the sources for the drugs that lead to an overdose, it is somebody that they know and it is somebody they trusted. It is oftentimes their boyfriend or their girlfriend that provided the drug. And we've got that evidence right there on their cell phone. They're specifically asking, or a friend from school, can you bring me some pills tonight? Or, or whatever the, the language is that, that they're speaking through their cell phones. And we are very grateful for this information that, that a lot of families are providing for us, the, the cell phone data, because we want to find out where it's coming from. And what is sad is we're seeing a, a lot of prosecutions, and it, it's, you know, we're not talking about some violent drug dealer out on the streets who's, who's doing this. It's oftentimes a, a, the best friend that they have got known since kindergarten who provided the pill that ultimately led to the death, and that, and that kid is now being charged. And not only are they living with the guilt that they may have killed their best friend or their girlfriend, but now they're looking at charges and they're gonna to have to deal with that the rest of their life. And ultimately we will interview that person, try to find out where they got it. But one of the things that is a common thread is they had no idea that it had fentanyl in it. These are going to look just like US pharmaceutical oxycodone. Um, they're buying the raw material from China. The drug cartels are buying these pill presses that you can get on eBay. You can get them on back page Craigslist and they produce 3000 pills a minute. And so they use the raw material, they make their own stamps. So the stamps are gonna look just like US oxycodone. They're also gonna look just like US uh, Xanax and you're not gonna be able to tell the difference. We have seized and, and shut down five of these labs in Oklahoma just in the last three years. They're not all being made on the border or outside the US. Some of these labs are right here in Oklahoma. One not too far from here down in Wawoka uh, just three years ago that was mass producing thousands upon thousands of Xanax bars and they were all fentanyl. There was no Xanax in it. And most of these don't have any uh, Xanax or hydrocodone or, or oxy in it. it. It's all vitamin K, vitamin B, and about 13% fentanyl. And that will be the, ma the mixture that will allow somebody to think they're taking oxycodone. Now you heard in these stories that yes, it can be 50 to 100 to 1,000 times stronger than morphine, but that's not the majority of the problem that we're seeing with the deaths. The death is Fentanyl by itself is a very powerful drug. The idea is they make it to where you can't tell the difference if you've had oxycodone because many of the people who are buying it think that's what they're getting and they could not tell the difference. But there is something that is very tricky about fentanyl. The body will start using it up much quicker. The body feels like it's starting to go through dope sick and so what they do is they take some more. And oftentimes that first dose is still in the body when they put the second dose in. And it, it does have a similar half-life, kind of like morphine does. But you even heard in the video that this one girl only took a half a pill. I can't tell you how many bedroom we've, we've been in when we're investigating an overdose and they only took a quarter of the pill or the half of the pill and that still killed them. And that, that testifies to how strong it is, but you're also stacking one dose on top of the other. It's not that it was this 50 or 100 or 1,000 times stronger. Uh, that stuff is out there, don't, don't get me wrong, but we've been blessed here in Oklahoma not to see 
those types of fentanyl in Oklahoma. It's, it's Oma fentanyl, it's Rima fentanyl, it's, it's Al fentanyl and Theo fentanyl that can be a thousand to 10,000 times stronger. Just an airborne particle would be enough to, to, to kill everybody in this room. We have seen similar strengths when you'll see Cincinnati, Ohio, 47 people overdose in a 24 hour period. In Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia, they had 47 overdoses in, in uh, 36 hours. This was all a brand new batch of, fent of heroin that had come into those cities and it was cut with the stronger types of, of fentanyl. We've been fortunate not to have those clusters yet in Oklahoma. I think the most we deaths we've had in one single scene was three people at an Oklahoma City home who all died from fentanyl um, at the same time, but they were, they were also taking the, those pills. But it is concerning because it's also being pressed, as you heard in that video, not just oxycodone or Xanax, we're finding it in Tylenol, or we're finding it to look just like Tylenol. And this is a, a technique that the cartels are using to, to get it in the United States, and it's also a technique that street dealers are using. So on a traffic stop, not many police officers are going to look into a bottle of Tylenol, and even if they do pour it out, it's going to look like a handful of Tylenol. That is the design of it, why they mimic this. But we're finding it now in so many of the, the samples we're submitting to OSBI for uh, heroin. Um, probably the majority of the heroin that we're seizing in Oklahoma is now 100% fentanyl. There is no heroin in it. Um, a lot of the methamphetamine that we're now seizing coming in from Mexico is, is uh, to some degree containing fentanyl. Now there's not a big demand for it. Most drug addicts have their drug of choice and they're not going to want something that's been adulterated, but there's certain groups that do want that. And so it will cater to that group. We're finding marijuana that is now testing positive for fentanyl. And again, that is not by accident. They're, they're, again, there's people who are going to notice the difference, but there's certain people who do want marijuana that has fentanyl in it because they're not getting high from traditional marijuana anymore and they're looking for something else. And so there's not much that we're not finding that cannot be adulterated with fentanyl. It, it is just so cheap, but also so powerful that it is now the go-to filler for the drug traffickers out of Mexico and uh, bringing that here into Oklahoma. So that's where we are today. Um, and, and we are making a lot of head roads. It just last week we got nine pounds of, of fentanyl and that's traced us back to a, a major contributor here in Oklahoma City and we're working several of those types of cases to go after these people who are trafficking in the multi-quantities. Uh, but every day that there, there's, there's so many more overdoses, as I said, about seven to ten a night just at the Oklahoma City hospitals. And so I can't stress enough to, to, to talk to your, your teens, talk to your loved ones about this. Um, because they're, they're most, nine out of ten are not going to know they even took fentanyl. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate it. This one's going to be directed to Dr. Rojas. Tell us what signs or societal issues might be contributing to people using or wanting to use or experiment. My goodness. Uh, so, I've been at this for 30 years and uh, I'm writing the last chapters of my career at the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, which I forgot to mention, by the way, Behavioral Health Services. But, you know, I really think that we've got to look at what drives this curiosity, what drives this seeking relief from pain, physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological. You know, um, when you are uncomfortable with your mind inside your own body when you're tormented by your thoughts I mean these things are going to be appealing substances of abuse do what they promise they alter mind they alter mood they alter reality and until we recognize that we got to get folks help sooner you know, we got to get young people help sooner we got to communicate that it's okay to talk to somebody about what's going on uh, and you can talk to somebody before it gets really bad. You don't have to wait for it to get bad to talk to somebody. But, you know, from my perspective, um, I think it's just going to be important to really think about what drives this, what drives this destructive behavior, what drives addictive behavior, what drives a young person to be curious about substances, you know, is there a way as a society we can you know, meet some of those needs in healthier ways and other ways. Um, and uh, I just think we're going to have to figure out a way to do that. Otherwise, these things become appealing. You know, if you don't know about the nature of drugs, they do what they promise. Right now, if we took drugs, we'd feel differently. We'd act differently. 
but uh, we got to help people understand there's other more natural ways to do that you know through our faith through uh, recreation through therapy through support group meetings even through meetings like this you know there's a lot of neurochemistry and a lot of uh, positive and sad emotions that we're experiencing sitting here but you know just being here together tonight takes out a little bit of the poison a little bit of the sting and we've got to we've got to figure out how to foster more community more open dialogue and uh, <clears throat> I'm a grandfather so I get a little more sentimental about this um, we have to start telling people it's okay to reach out and get help and that you're not broken you're not defective you're not crazy you're not and all this other stuff we say and uh, that's that's what I want to encourage each of you to do tonight if you know somebody who's struggling give them permission to reach out talk to a chaplain a preacher uh, reach out to uh, <clears throat> counselor psychologists go to a meeting 12-step meeting churches now places of worship have recovery groups it's an amazing thing it's low threshold you know there isn't any insurance you just can walk in and <clears throat> if you've never experienced this there's nothing like being among your group of people whatever group that is whether it's veterans whether it's the sexual abuse survivors whether it's you know depressed uh, you know, there, there's a group of people that get you, understand you, want to help you, want to support you. Unfortunately, we have a group of parents now who've lost their children to this thing. And you know how comforting that might be to sit with those people. And so I just think we got to get at the, the drivers of this thing. And uh, uh, Mark's a wonderful person. He does a great job. He works hard. Every time I call him, it's yes. Every time I but he can't do this on the legal front you know each of us have to figure out a way to do our part uh, even if you're not an expert each of us all of you you know so um, I don't want to chew up all the time but I I want to encourage us to think about uh, giving people encouragement and hope who are hurting and there's a lot of people out there hurting folks. We've just been through a pandemic. If in some way you're not hurting because of that, I'd like to talk to you. Maybe you can help me. Thank you. Thank you. And moving forward, um, we're going to ask Drew Laboon this question because it comes up a lot. And that is, as someone in recovery and as someone who now works for a resource, a treatment facility, what are you seeing firsthand? And how are you experiencing in being someone in recovery and helping others? Well, thanks for saving the easy one for me, Kira. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> ask me the first part of that again, will you? <laughs> Absolutely. So what are you experiencing as someone in recovery, um, also working for a treatment facility, those people that you're trying to help what are you experiencing when it comes to fentanyl? So a lot of stigma, a lot of stigma, and it's it's kind of surprising and sad a lot of times that it's 2022 and there's still a stigma against drug addicts and alcoholics, um, folks that are struggling um, in our communities, in our homes. Uh, I, I love the opportunity to sit on these panels, particularly being the one when I, when I, the looks on everybody's faces when I say my experience in this deal is using drugs. Um, <clears throat> sometimes there's a lot of shock, but I'll be honest with you, never in a million years, um, and, and to show that recovery is possible, uh, I'm living proof because if you'd asked me three or four years ago if I'd have sat on a panel with a judge and a cop, uh, <clears throat> I'd have told you you're crazy. Um, the only time I would have been near a psychologist is, is to get EOD'd again, and that's the truth, and that's the reality of this thing. Um, we don't fight, um, and it's been my experience um, and my, my personal feelings, is that we're not going to fight this thing, we're not going to beat this thing and combat this thing in the judicial system. That's a fact. We're, we fight this thing and combat this thing in our homes. In our homes and in our communities every single day. Um, I love what Dr. Rojas said about, about uh, you know, the stigma, smashing the stigma and letting folks know it's okay to not be okay. Right? I think one of the most valuable things that we can do in our homes, those of you that have young folks or, or even adult children, when you're around together, tell them about Narcan, right? 
there's a four and a half minute video you can pull up on YouTube on how to use Narcan and it talks about overdose in there and it gets a little bit raw. I probably wouldn't show it to your 10 or 11 year old. Um, but you know, if you've got older teenage children and, and younger adults, <clears throat> show them those videos and teach them how to use Narcan, right? That's gonna be a way that they're not gonna be defensive, but they're gonna get the message that, hey, this is not only how I use Narcan, but also fentanyl's real. Because if you come at your kid and say, hey, don't use fentanyl, they're gonna do the no, never me, mom. Um, but, but educate, educate our folks, right? I was counting over here and now I'm short. So we, were, we have between 85 and 90 folks. I, the counting got a little fuzzy uh, back in that area. You can't see over everybody. But if everybody in this room tonight goes home and tells a family member, a loved one, a friend, posts it on social media and tags fentanyl overdose awareness, talks about this conference and gives a shout out, every single person in here, we're gonna reach 160 something people. Encourage your loved ones to share that message and let them know it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to reach out for help. What I'm seeing is, is, is people that are scared. They've let their families down. There's a whole lot of guilt and shame wrapped up in those of us in recovery, right? Because I was raised better than this. Or maybe I wasn't raised better than this, but that's why I shouldn't be doing this because I saw that in my home. I didn't see them. There, there, there's no right or wrong reason and there's no stereotype of a drug addict. And we'll continue to see the same things over and over again, so long as what we view as a drug addict is a person homeless under a bridge, sitting there with a jug that says XXX on it, right? Drug addicts and alcoholics aren't cartoons. We are real people, right? And the struggle is real. Um, but we've got to destigmatize this and let people know that, that there are resources out there that you can get help. But again, I'll say it, you know, our, our fine folks in the judicial system, I work closely with, with Judge Stoner um, in the vet court and the drug court program and they do tremendous work there, but we're not gonna combat the, the, the root of this problem in the judicial system. It's in our homes and in our communities every single day by reaching out to those that don't know, that haven't been here, and letting them know that this is an op opportunity. And I'll say this one last thing. <clears throat> it's not enough for us to sit in conferences and in meetings and in things like this and say, man, that sure is good. That, that, that deal was moving. I heard the testimonials of those parents and, and heard that, and man, that sure was good. Leave here with our hair on fire and never do a damn thing about it. We gotta put our hands on this work if we are ever gonna see anything change here, right? So when you leave here, please do that. Please do that. But do a social media post, tell somebody about this, about these resources and let them know, right? There's help out there, Narcan saves lives, and you don't have to suffer this alone because you're not bad, you're sick. I don't even know if I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a little tip that I've learned just from doing this for the last few months is out of 10 people that seek treatment in the state of Oklahoma, raise your hand if you know how many actually receive treatment. Here. It's two. Because you were at my last one, I, I knew it. <laughs> right. So the reality of it is, if 10 people are seeking treatment in the state of Oklahoma, two are actually receiving treatment. Two. That's very sad. And with the amount of resources that we have, collaboratively working together, them reaching out, like Drew said, is very important because we can make that, even if we make it four, we've doubled it. That is huge. So on that note, I'm going to ask Judge Stoner to tell us a little bit about what he's seeing in drug court. Uh, well, first of all, I didn't say that uh, I was telling you how rigorous our program is, uh, but I also didn't, I failed to mention that we have an 83% graduation rate. That means more of, uh, um, The national average for graduation from drug courts is about 60%. In Oklahoma County, if you're lucky enough to be have a case there, four out of five people come in and get their cases dismissed. And I know uh, what, your past does not have to equal your future. So if someone has been in alcohol for 15 years, meth for 20, or heroin for 30, it doesn't have to be that way. It depends on if you want to change and if you're willing to go through a process and, and seek help, ask for help, learn to trust the people you're around and uh, your, your past can change. Now, fentanyl, I, what we're seeing is that we've, we've had four people die in the last year and I'm actually surprised it's only been four. Uh, we've probably had oh, dozens of overdoses and I keep actually Narcan on my bench. Uh, yesterday I had one of our participants who was serving in court detention as part of his sanction and he nodded out in the courtroom on the on the jury box and he was watching we had to go wake him up make sure he wasn't 
ODing, but uh, it's um, uh, it. I got to tell you, it's, uh, it actually, I'm, I'm by nature, I'm a serial optimist. I, I really see the best in people. I think the, the best is possible. On this issue of fentanyl, uh, I am scared to death. And um, I am afraid, and I hope that I am wrong, that it is going to get far worse before it gets better. This is what we're seeing right now. And I just, I really think that we're on the front end of something that's going to get a lot worse than it is now. Uh, and I hate to say it, and, and, and the reason I say that is because if you just, you've got to spend time trying to understand the big picture of what's really happening. And uh, one of the best resources out there is, is a, a couple of books by a guy named Sam Quinones. He wrote a book called Dreamland that talks about how the opioid crisis evolved in the United States um, and how the Mexican cartel started growing hundreds of thousands of acres of poppies to make heroin to fill that need of the opioids. Uh, and now he's wrote a second book called The Least of Us that is, talks about the rise of fentanyl and manufactured substances out of these Mexican cartels. And we start understanding the economics of this, we are really on the front end of something that is absolutely terrifying to me when you understand that all of a sudden what, what used to be one hundreds of thousands of fields of poppies that the heroin crop depended upon water and rain and sun, you know, sun and the, and, and the agriculture and the workers it would take to harvest it and then the processing of all these poppies to make our heroin. We have, we have a lot of people are addicted to, to heroin. And also now the cartels realize that they don't need hundreds of thousands of acres. All they need is a room that's a one third the size of this and it needs to be next to a port that gets chemicals from India and China and they can make far more, far more of, of a, something that's very, very similar, uh, the way it reacts with the body and the type of high that you have uh, for pennies on the dollar. And so the, all the poppies, I don't know that they're really going away, but why in the world would you, if you're in the cartel business and your business is selling heroin, uh, my overhead over here is all these fields of poppies and processing and watering and and it's depending upon the weather, or I could just have a, a little small room and get my chemicals and I could, I could cut my costs uh, by about 90%. And all of a sudden I've got a product now that's also a lot easier to smuggle across the border because we can make it look like Tylenol. And so um, I, the, the cartels, I believe they don't really want to kill people, but they don't care if you die. Um, they're, the problem is they're, they're, they don't really understand how to mix this in a way that's actually scientific. So in these pills, if they're just not mixed correctly, that little, you know, you, you saw the video. I mean, it's, if you, uh, think of six, six little grains of salt gets you high. Nine grains kills you. I mean, the difference between life and death is just, is minuscule. Um, and that's if, if, you're, if, you're, if you know that you're using fentanyl, how careful you have to be. And then as, Mark was saying there's something called carfentanil. All these other substances are even more powerful, and the the reason they're doing it is obviously it's far far cheaper. Uh, it's also f far easier to get it across the border, and so um, I I think we're just on the front end of of something that's just terrifying. That that um, it's it's here to stay. I don't know how we're going to stop it. Drew is correct. We're not going to stop. It. We we can save the people that come into the court. If they want to change, they want to be different. We have, uh, you know, we, we're really lucky that we have really good treatment professionals, and we do have access to resources. We need more access to resources, but um, it's. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do, but I do. I want to echo what Drew was saying. We, we, we need everybody in our community to go tell everybody else. I know you think you might be buying a Percocet or you might be buying an Oxy, but that is it is playing Russian roulette. You are playing Russian roulette and you will die. And people don't really fully understand that. And I, like I said, I think we're on the front end of it. We're, it's gonna be here for a long time and it's gonna get worse before it gets better. We have to get the word out, and especially to our kids and anybody that might use, you cannot trust street drugs anymore. I mean, the methamphetamine, I mean, I, 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 mean, I have people in my drug court program that come in and they, they do, you know, they're they have a relapse somewhere along the way and they use methamphetamine, but they actually test positive for methamphetamine and fentanyl. And they'll just say, yeah, judge, I, I, I guess I did relapse or relapse on methamphetamine. 
um, you know, and so they'll get some kind of a sanction and a response, a therapeutic response. Um, but I didn't know it had, I didn't know I had fentanyl in it. I didn't know. Like, well, yeah, you're testing positive for two substances and they don't even know they're methamphetamine. Um, their the cannabis is now laced with, uh, with this. And um, I don't, I do understand, if, you, know, uh, you know, a lot of uh, our, you know, I remember John Belushi, you know, John Belushi died with a speedball. He liked heroin and he liked speed at the same time. So if you, if you mix speed and, and you know, uh, an opiate together, uh, you get a high, but you're not all the jitteries. And so I think there are a lot of people that do like that combination. Um, but I mean, just the difference between six and nine grains of sand is a difference between life and death. So um, I don't know what we're doing, but it's, it's very prevalent. And in the last year, uh, I mean, when I first started as a drug court judge, I was aware of fentanyl. I was aware of it. I kind of been you know, reading about it was kind of out there somewhere, you know, it's always, it's always out on California or something. And, uh, man, it's here. Uh, and, uh, I don't know what we're going to do. I'm sorry. So, you know, that's all my remarks. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we can't put a face to someone who is experiencing substance use disorder or someone who might be at risk of experiencing it. It can be, someone sitting in your living room. It can be a family member out for a holiday dinner. Um, it can be your kid going to a soccer game and the mother sitting next to him. There is no face to who is at risk for this. And so what we can do is provide you a loved one who has actually experienced a loss. And so that's where our next person comes in. Um, this, is, this is fresh and this is new. So she's being exceptionally vulnerable. Um, and we appreciate that. But she has experienced the loss of her son to fentanyl, and I'll allow her the opportunity to just kind of tell a little bit about her story. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to start my story about my son, Riley. He was 29 years old. Um, Riley was a force larger than life. Riley um, lived his own life unapologetically. Um, Riley's brain, as you were talking about, sort of never shut off. Um, he was a complicated person, but he was precious. And his heart was so big, and he loved everyone. Didn't matter where he came from, what your background, what your history, he didn't care. He loved you. He didn't always receive the same love because he was. Riley was very special. He just, his energy will be greatly missed. Riley um, was a college graduate. He actually had just recently spoken with some of his professors from UCO because he finally much to my excitement, had decided to go to grad school. Um, tiny bit of backstory. Riley has struggled with drugs and alcohol for a very long time, um, 17 years to be exact. So, you know, this is a battle we've been in for a very long time. Um, you know, highs and lows along the way. Didn't always like him, but loved him all the time. And our family together did everything that we could possibly do. And Riley knew that. <clears throat> well, Riley was a functioning addict and it was when he started using heroin two years ago that he came to me and told me that for the first time in his life, he felt like a drug addict. He was functioning prior to, made good grades, had a job, um, but never considered himself a drug addict because he was able to function through life doing what he was doing. When he started using heroin, 
that changed. And when he started using fentanyl, then things really changed. So Riley and I have been extremely close his entire life. Um, we did not shy away from his drug issues. We were very open in conversation. We didn't sweep it under the rug. He knew as well as the family that we were in the fight of our lives. When he started using fentanyl, he came to me and he said, Mom, I need your help. Fentanyl is going to kill me. So I helped him. We drove to um, Tennessee and we stayed on a commune drug-free commune um, we left and he had just used his last bit of fentanyl just prior to getting in the car to go thank you so basically the first four days that we were at the commune was riley detoxing And I'll tell you, that's a really difficult thing to watch your child go through. It was very painful, physically painful for him, emotionally painful for me, but we stuck it out and we got through it. Well, I stayed another four days and I came back home to Oklahoma and Riley stayed there because it was a safe place for him to be. So he was there maybe six, eight weeks, and he came home, was tiring of sort of the monotony of the place and was ready for a change of scenery. So he came home and within a very short time OD on fentanyl. And it's only because First of all, he didn't use alone. He was not by himself when he did this. You can't use fentanyl alone. If you know that's what you're using, you can't use it alone. You just can't do it. Well, he OD'd and Narcan was available. And so they were able to bring him back. And as I said, Riley and I are very close. We've never sugar-coated his drug issues, and so he told me of his OD. And he said to me, Mom, I'm scared of fentanyl. Really long story, a little shorter. Riley went to drug treatment February 2nd. As a mother of a son who has battled drugs and addiction for 17 years, I never believed he would go to treatment. It just didn't seem an option that he was interested in. Well, he came to me and said, I'm going to treatment, I need help, fentanyl's gonna kill me. So we flew him out to California and he went through 60 days of treatment, which is great but it, that's not nearly long enough. That's one of my crusades, by the way, I've decided. Um, but when insurance ran out and treatment was over, he had to come home to where all the trouble started. Well, he came home April 22nd and he died of an accidental fentanyl overdose on April 27th. You know, he went to treatment for heroin and fentanyl because that's when he feels like in his mind he became a drug addict. You know, I mean, meth, yes, he's done it, whatever. 
he had convinced himself when he came back that, you know, he'd never use heroin or fentanyl again, but it would be okay to smoke a little meth. So the day he died, I saw him at 3.30, and he was at our home, our family home where he was raised, and he was in his room sitting at his computer um, desk playing a video game. So I walked into the room and I was telling him how proud I am of him and he questioned why and I said, because of grad school. He said, well, I haven't gotten in yet, mom, so don't be too proud yet. And I said, but Riley, you have to want to go first and you want to go and I'm so happy about that and I'm so proud of you and wow, this is great. I made him stand up. I don't know why, again. I made him stand, that they showed on the movie. I don't, I don't know why, but I made him stand up and we embraced and he was such a snuggler and just gave the greatest hugs and big kiss and I love you back and forth. And I walked out of his room and I said, I'm gonna go get in the shower. Well, I showered pretty quickly and got out of the house, maybe within a half an hour. And as I was leaving, I noticed that his bedroom door was now closed. I didn't think anything about it, whatever. Um, I went to my daughter's for a little while. Apparently she sort of recognized that I was feeling a little antsy about something. She suspected it was Riley. Um, she said, why don't you go home and, you know, just check on him, whatever. So I stopped and got food for us walked into our home, hoped that he would hear me come in and he would just come out and we'd eat dinner, but he did not do that. So I knocked on his door and I got no response. So I opened his door and he was sitting in the same chair that he had been in when I saw him last but he was slumped over the arm of the chair and both arms were down over his head, kind of laying on the floor and his head was in a downward position. And he had this beautiful long brown hair I meant to bring a photo and I forgot. So his hair had kind of fallen down over his face. So I walked in and I saw him and I yelled his name, no response. So then I screamed his name as I shook him and he was cold. And as I shook him, his hair sort of tousled out of his face a little bit and he was bloated and he was purple like a plum. And my life changed at that moment because I, he was very clearly dead. Well, it's been three weeks. It was such a shock to everyone because he'd been clean for 82 days and it's all he talked about was his sobriety. In his mind from heroin and fentanyl. He had a plan he was making decisions that would benefit his future. He was setting goals. He was, in his words, reintroducing himself to his family and friends. And he had plans that night. I saw him at 3.30. The girl he was supposed to meet with started texting him at four and she never got a response. So I think probably, I think I was in the shower when my son died in my home. By the time I found him, Narcan would not have helped. Um, you know, he had OD'd on fentanyl, so he understood better than most the dangers of that drug and, and literally was afraid of it. So, I had to do a little research, I had to make some phone calls, I had to start talking to some people because it didn't make sense what happened. And so, I don't know if this is just to soothe my own mother's heart, and if it is, that'll be okay for now. But I think probably 
that Riley thought he was smoking methamphetamine based on what they found when the narcotics division showed up to the crime scene at my home. Um, I think he thought he was smoking meth and it was laced with fentanyl because toxicology found meth and fentanyl. I don't believe he ever would have used a loan. I just, he was too smart for that. Um, so it was an accident. He had no intention of dying that day. He certainly did not want me to find him. He would not have done that to me, which tells me he had no idea. He had no idea. So here I am. Riley's forever 29. And I got a few things to say about this. And we all have to start talking about it. If, if this can happen to Riley, Riley comes from a, you know, a good family. I mean, we, we've, we've, we've stuck together through thick and thin for decades. Um, and he was smart about it and, and he lost friends to it. And the, the, the young man that I never believed would go to treatment in a million years was so afraid of fentanyl, he figured out a way to get himself there. That was a big step. He'd always come to mom for help for things. And I was, you know, I said, Riley, you're going to have to figure it out on your own. And he did. He was so afraid of it that he figured out how to get insurance and he figured out how to get to drug treatment. But he's still dead. So I'm glad all of y'all are here tonight. Thank you again for letting me come speak. Right now I'm just kind of trying to keep busy. <laughs> I know that I've got some pretty heavy grief in my future, but I'm a little too pissed off to be perfectly honest with you right now to fall into that. I need to speak for my son because he had so much left to say and because there was so much more to him than what took his life. Um, so I'm here to help in any way I can. I I'm ready to start talking about it. And, and trying to get some people to start listening. So, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your story. For sharing that story. Thank you. And being vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, speaking of support in those situations, there are resources that you can turn to. That directs my next question to Ms. Ann Benson with Parents Helping Parents. Um, please tell us what resources are available um, and, and how you all are working with the community for these situations. Well, thank you for letting me share about those. And um, again, my, my heart is full because um, at the, the, the basis of all we're doing is being there for families. And um, I just, um, it's, it's such a tragedy for any of us to um, have lost one of our our beautiful children and even when they're still alive with us there's still a lot of grieving that goes on for families because we have hopes and dreams and um we we just don't picture this is what is going to happen and um this idea of the of um you know what we were talking about the shame um it, it, it goes beyond just the person who's using. The family starts to absorb that as well. Um, because we know we're good, loving families. We're good parents. We're not perfect parents. None of us are. But we love our kids, and we do the best we can. And we have good kids, as, as you know, we've, we, we know when um, something like this hits home. They are, they are beautiful, beautiful souls, and we love them. And so um, as what happens when um, people are struggling with substances, families tend to mirror those same patterns. 
we, we, we're in those same spirals. We get pulled down by shame. We get pulled down by isolation. And we, we, um, we live in fear, you know. Our kids live in fear because of what's happened to them. We live in fear too. And that fear, it takes away our ability to feel at all empowered and to know that um, we don't have to face this alone. And when we can learn some tools and when we can um, meet collectively and know that, um, yeah, there's others out there like us going through us that we can relate to this and, and we can um, support one another. It can be a game changer. And of course, there is no guarantee for any of us that um, there isn't any magic formula, do this and this and this, and you know we'll have a good outcome. But um, it's really hard to um, do this alone. So you know, many of us who have had our own children struggle have realized the value in connecting. So parents helping parents is one of those resources, and it was started in 2001 by a group of parents who said, we can't do this in isolation. We need each other, and we need to connect. And so it kind of rose organically um, because it was needed, and, and that need wasn't being met otherwise. We were being kept in isolation, and the focus was on the people struggling, not on the families who, again, um, start to have our own journey. And we realize when we're connected, um, we can have the power to, um, number one, understand our own wellness is important as well. This isn't just impacting others. Our own, our own um, health and our mental health, our physical health, our spiritual health, everything becomes impacted. And so learning and giving ourselves permission to take care of ourselves in the process and know that it's not selfish to invest in some self-care. We can't be strategic. We can't really be at our best to help our loved one if we're operating from a place of fear and we're depleted. So we, we learn those tools and we get that support when we connect and we learn about some resources. So Parents Helping Parents was developed and spread to various communities in Oklahoma mm -hmm. with the mission of um, education. So we would bring in speakers. Uh, many people sitting up here with me have been on our, our, our panels um, and, and have really shared with parents so they could understand what are the issues, what are the drugs, what's recovery, what's, what's, um, you know, what's sober living look like in aftercare. What's the judicial system look like? All those things are things that um, we, we don't instinctively know when we bring our loved one home from the, you know, when they're born. We don't get a how to raise a drug-free kid manual with our Dr. Spock book and all our other things. And so, you know, our tendency is to pull the covers up over our heads and just hope for the best because it's so overwhelming and we're so full of fear in that process. Or we think, as, as you know, we've learned here, we think somehow it, it will happen somewhere else, but not to us. And um, denial and then shame are huge things that keep parents isolated. So this idea that we can get together and learn about these issues and talk about these issues, so important. And then where are the resources? You know, even if we're learning about these things, where do we go for help? You know, who, what is that process of finding treatment look like? Um, we don't know these things, and we certainly don't know who are the resources in our community. Anybody can do Google searches, but really talking to other families who have been there that have utilized resources, so powerful. And, you know, we're, we're all such a wealth of our own journeys in this process. Many of us have you know, been on these paths for a lot of years, and it is a really amazing, amazing community of recovery and treatment we have here, but people don't know about it. So, you know, and the third thing is just that support. Just again, feeling like 
we're not alone. There's others that really get us and understand us because they're going through this too. Just like people who are trying to find recovery need, they need to find people who understand them that are just like them so they don't feel that isolation and loneliness because you know they're sensitive souls and we're sensitive souls in how we're trying to navigate this too. So um, parents helping parents, again, you know, we're volunteers, it's free. We have meetings online now. Anybody can access it. Amazing, amazing resource we have in our state. And um, you know, we would love to, we, we, if you'd like to get more information on our meetings, we have a, a sheet over there that we can put you on an undisclosed list and you'll receive the Zoom links for our meetings and we can support you one-on-one because -on -one we have helplines and other ways that, that we connect. Um, beyond that, my own personal journey, um, kind of you know, stepping out of the shadows and understanding my voice was important and my journey was important, it was important to step out. It connected me personally on a journey I never thought I would be on. My day job, I, I, I spent 30 years, I'm a licensed architect, and I work for an architecture firm. But I got so interested and so passionate about the journey for families and recovery and what all that meant is that I went back to school and I chipped away at a master's in social work. And from there, when I ended up retiring, I was starting to, um, find out about other resources through conferences and different things. So I found out about an opportunity to be trained as a parent peer coach. And so I um, got that training through Partnership to End Addiction. And um, from there, when I retired, I was offered a position on their helpline. So I was able to start supporting families all over the country. Lots of, lots of people I talked to, you know, scared to death about fentanyl, other drugs, lots of people who have lost loved ones, lots of journeys, but everybody needs support, resources, information. And I also, on a weekly basis, I, um, I co-facilitate a parent support group through partnership. It's a national group, it's free. So every week, it's about learning some tools and um, support. And so I'd be glad to tell you more about that. You know, all these resources for free that people don't know about. And you know, part of the journey I learned is that um, a lot of the ways that on my own, on my own instincts, I tried to help my son. Um, I, I, I had good intentions, but there were things that in essence built walls and pushed him away. You know, he, um, he, it, things bounced off him. This won't happen to me. Or mom's getting so emotional. I'm adding other burdens to him. Look what you're doing to me. And all these things were very overwhelming to him. And so when I started to learn that I could, I could have a different um, way of communicating with him and I could build a relationship with him that was still based on my own healthy boundaries about what I needed. Um, and my own self-care, but I could approach him with compassion. I could really, in a genuine way, start to have communication to understand his journey. And um, that, that enabled him to, um, to really start to think for himself about um, you know, um, what was going on for him. And um, it, so instead of the conflict, kind of always being between me and him and the expectations. Um, I was able through these strategies to um, pull the conflict to be within him. So he was more looking at his own cost benefit analysis and thinking, you know, these drugs are really meaningful to me. I get something out of it. It's, it's rewarding in this way, but all the other things are not worth it. So I learned a different language, I learned some tools, and I don't have a magic formula. All I know is I take this a day at a time, and I can't do this alone. So these resources, like Partnership to End Addiction, free coaching program where parents can work one-on-one -on -one with another parent who's been trained in some of these tools, 
who can be in your corner, um, you know, helps all of us to try and approach this from a more proactive, empowering position where we're not being driven by fear. I mean, this is scary enough, and we all need help. Families need help. Our loved ones need help. So I would be happy to share more about some of the resources, but the biggest takeaway is you're not alone. And so um, appreciate the opportunity to share. Thank you, Anna, I appreciate it. Now we're gonna open it up for questions. If you have a question, would you please come? You can if you're loud like me, you, you don't have to use the mic, but if you have a specific question. Yeah, John Kuhn, Oklahoma Health Professions Program. This is from Mark Woodward. Mark, um, I was sitting there thinking, what about the fentanyl test strips? Have you ever uh, thought about distributing those from the government on a, a, a this wide basis? That way, if some, you know, he has them at home, you know, you could, you know, he probably had methamphetamine, you could do a fentanyl test strip and find out if it's fentanyl. But I, 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 I was just wondering if the government ever took that position. Well, I can tell you that that's an issue that a lot of uh, our legislators are looking at, uh, studying what some of the other states are doing when it comes to fentanyl test strips and what can we adopt here in Oklahoma to make sure we do it right. And so that, that is certainly something that several different agencies, not so much the law enforcement, the Bureau of Narcotics, but some of our uh, social uh, service agencies are looking into to make sure that we set up a program that will do it right. So I, I can see that happening here in Oklahoma very soon. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. We started a pilot program in Oklahoma County Drug Court where our treatment providers are all trained, obviously, and then the pilot program is working with the Department of Mental Health to have a fentanyl test strip uh, pilot program with um, in our community health organizations uh, in Oklahoma County. So the ones we're working with, like NorCare, Hope, Red Rock, um, that provide treatment to people in drug court. They're also provided with Narcan, they're also provided with fentanyl test strips. Now we haven't actually started it yet, but we're, we've got, got the kind of groundwork for it, Alexa, but works. we want to do it the right way and do it responsibly so you're not encouraging use, but at the same time, making these things available so people aren't dying, you know? So more, more to report on that probably, I don't know, six, eight months from now, we'll see where it's at. Hi y'all, I'm Andrew Walters. I'm one of the tribal legislators here with the CPM. Uh, I'm also a retired cop retiring back when Mark was probably learning to ride a bicycle. <laughs> so I have kind of a different, I'm, not, I'm trying to catch up to this with my mind. And in today's world, where you have to use the right terminology, I don't know what to call what I'm about to ask you. But you said you had an 83% graduation rate. What is your recidivism rate? Uh, about 9%. What we know is 9% uh, of people that graduate the program come back into the justice system within three years. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, I, I wish I'd say every, all 83% of people who graduate are, you know, substance free for the rest of their life. I don't, I don't know what a relapse rate is. Um, it's going obviously it's going to be higher than that, but uh, the population that we work with are the frequent flyers in the drug court. I mean, these are the ones that, these are the people that uh, generally did not do well on normal probation, usually multiple times, or they've already been to prison once or twice and they're back again, but they have an underlying moderate severe drug issue, addiction. And the belief is if you can teach somebody, if you think about addiction is uh, it, just to focus on the substance is really the, or the wrong way to do it. It's more like getting stuck in a traffic jam. Uh, and, and you know, if you've been in a traffic jam, there's three cars wide and 20 cars deep. The, the, the drug is a car that's in front of you. And that car can't move until the car in front of that can move, until the car in front of that can move, until, you know, it's a systems issue. And you kind of got to get everything from safe, stable, sober housing and support and encouragement and access to resources and, um, you, know, you know, meaningful work, social interactions, a, sen a, a sense of uh, citizenship or spirituality and kind of wellness. And um, so you help people get better. And when you do that, it's like getting the traffic jam and stuff, and then the drug gets out of the way. Right. So, well, I understand the facts, but I, I'm actually shocked by that. Yeah. Uh, most of the older in courts, if you had 75% recidivism, or just 25% <clears throat> successful, they consider that a good program. So that's amazing. Yeah. I, I, I give a lot of credit to, we have an incredible <laughs> team uh, in Oklahoma County. We also have access to a lot of resources. You know, sometimes when people, we feel like they're bragging, it's like, well, if you're from an outlying county, uh, you may not have access to some of the resources that we've got. You know, we started using Medicaid-assisted treatment 
we have access to a lot of sober living environments where if you're in a smaller community, they don't have it. And that's such a big part of, of long-term recovery. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of where we're at. I think we still have more work to do, but um, thanks for your comments. Well, thank you. Just for your information, we have a drug court here with our tribe, for our tribal court. Okay. And Judge Lujan monitors that, and we have a tremendous uh, success rate with that program. Okay. If you're ever interested, call Judge Lujan and talk to him. I think he's going yeah. to play it. Do a set of talk to me. For sure. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. I am an um, LPC, um, and I work with, at the crisis center in Oklahoma City. So I work a lot with North Carolina, Red Rock, Hope, all that kind of stuff. But my question is, I work with a lot of homeless people, not just homeless people. We see a lot of um, drug use coming in. With fentanyl, I am wondering, what is it about that drug? that makes it more powerful. I don't, I don't know if I'm asking that right. Um, what is it that makes that the go-to at this, at this point? I know it's been mixed with other things, but what is it about fentanyl? Maybe Drew's, Drew's used that before, so maybe he could tell us. Well, it's, <clears throat> I tell you, on the, the, the reason to go to fentanyl on the business side of it, if you look at it from, from a drug dealer, it's the, it's the, that flash the bang, like, right? So it's real cheap and you make a lot of money with it. So follow the money. On the user side of it, fentanyl is a really good high, right? And that's real controversial. A lot of people don't want to talk about that, that's taboo. But anybody that struggles with addiction that tells you drugs don't feel good is lying. Drugs feel great until you burn your life to the ground. That's when it's a problem right because I, I absolutely torch my life when I when I'm in active addiction but fentanyl is an incredible high so let's just get that out there and get that out of the way right that's why we go back to it but what's in it that makes it an, an incredible high it's like heroin you know it's a it's a it's, it's that opioid it, hit, it hits on your opioid receptors and it feels like laying in a bunch of clouds and you're you've got warm gloves wrapped around you and um, I mean, the way I've heard it described is just a, it's a very peaceful, warm, um, comfortable feeling. And, and so, it, it, like, I don't know, if, let's say if you it's like beer here, uh, if you like beer, well, you can have a Budweiser, you can have a Coors, um, heroin, or you have fentanyl. Well, the Budweiser over here is, um, I don't know my beer price these days, but it's uh, you know, $12 for a 12 pack, and you could have the fentanyl over here for uh, $6 for a 12 pack. And so I'm going to buy the fentanyl because my, my, I, I, it just goes further. I might prefer Budweiser, but this is cheaper. I'm going to buy more of that. So it's, it's kind of a business decision, and, and they're going to be kind of similar in the way they affect you. They, they kind of feel, it feels a lot like <coughs> heroin. And there's, there, it, it does. It does. It's a lot stronger, and there's a, there's a lot of drugs out there that, that some will just ease your mind, right? Like you've got your cannabis that, that you feel that little bit, but it's more in the mind. But, but the thing about the fentanyl and the intense opiates is it's both. <clears throat> I get that feeling from the tip of my toes to the top of my head, but also my mind, it, it unwinds my mind. And for a few moments, it quiets the voices that are constantly racing in my head. But so, go ahead, I'm sorry. That, well, that's, that's why the, the clinical approach is so important. Because I've got to find a way to quiet those voices, a spiritual program Outside of that, I, it's everything working in concert together, right? So, fentanyl is a hell of a high. That's that's why people use it. I'm gonna try to tackle this here. So, um, so the things I think about are number one, it's more potent. So, the way it activates those mu receptors, right? It it it. <laughs> it has a higher affinity for those receptors. So it, it goes after them and it activates them. Well, what's not just, makes it potent? Not, well, this, this is part of what I'm trying to explain. Okay. So part of it is the activation of those mu receptors, which give you that analgesic effect, that euphoria effect, that pain-free effect, right? And then in the brain, you have the release of dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter associated with pleasure, right? So you've got pleasure, you've got pain release, and and it's its affinity for that mu receptor. And one of the things Narcan does is it, it removes it from the receptor, right? It, it knocks it off. 
but not for a long time, for 30 minutes, right? And then the overdose process can kick back in. So, so without going into a neuroanatomy lesson, it, it has to do with the affinity for the receptor and its potency and that it crosses the blood-brain barrier much more quickly. And so not all drugs do that. So there's a lot of things going on in the brain that, <clears throat> that cause it to have those effects, but the way he's describing it is legit. It, it does what it promises. It does it better than all of the other substances. And it's a legitimate pharmaceutical. I mean, if you're having open heart surgery, uh, you'll get a fentanyl. If you're having, I just, I just had a, a participant who had a, a dislocated shoulder and they gave him a fentanyl to be able to put his shoulder back into place. And so it's something that our, that we see at the use medical establishment. So it's, uh, it's a legitimate pharmaceutical, but except they just figured out how to make it uh, in a clandestine lab. Uh, just really efficiently and really cheaply. So it's just, you know, it's much more available now too. Well, and, and last question. So we have people that come in and say they're on PCP and they could be the littlest person and but the strongest person. <clears throat> How could we recognize that, that someone might be using fentanyl? Does that make sense? Come on, panel yep. professional. They're not going to be strong. They're going to be real chill, real mellow, and it's going to look like you poured them into that chair right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're yeah, kind of they're not now. They're kind of doing yeah, this right here. This yeah. they're just they're they're just they're kind of like they're just kind of nodding out constantly, having maybe trouble standing up, and you two they're kind of bent over a little bit, and you know they're really chill. Yeah, they're not they're not on the PCP side. Yeah. <laughs> it's a completely As different. As a clinician, look for pinpoint pupils. That's a sign of opioid intoxication. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Y'all know her. I love Paris. I'm Lisa's sister. I didn't no. try. Get together, Andrea. I'm way worse than she is. Okay. So I, I kind of understand her question as far as um, what is it made of? Shove that pill bottle of a grain of salt looking something. How can you possibly mix it with anything that it doesn't kill everybody? Yeah. That that's, takes the yeah, that's the problem. So what happens? So you, if the, the cartels have figured out that it's a lot easier to smuggle if it's really concentrated. So they, they really concentrate it so it's easier to get across the border. And when they get it over here, they mix it, but they are not, they're not skilled at, at mixing farm. Like literally when they're busting these labs, they'll have like Nutri blenders. I mean, that's like the street level. They'll take a Nutri blender and they put all the other additives in there. Nutri blend, Nutri blend, Nutri blend. And they kind of think have a little blender. And so you have these street level dealers that are cutting something that is 50 to hundred times power, more powerful than morphine. And so, uh, you know, if, if you get it at the hospital, it, you know, it's, it's made, like a pharmaceutical and it's properly blended, but they're blending it in neutral blenders and they're, they're, they smuggle it across the border in, in the highly concentrated form and they, they bring it across and that's when they start you know, trying to. So we know what it's made of specifically? They uh, the chemical it. structure, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a synthetic. I mean, it's, I, it's, I've heard meth and everything else, it can be everything under your kitchen sink as far as that goes. Is, is it the same situation? The precursors. Also, I used, I used to run a program called the Victims Impact Panel. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Sure. Do we have anything like that in our schools that are teaching these kids what this stuff does? I'll take this one. <laughs> yes, so what we're doing is there's a, there's a program called LEAD, L-E-A-D, that goes into the schools, and they're kind of going against the don't use drugs kind of thing now, um, to where it's, don't use anything. Don't fall to peer pressure. And they're going more the stigma and the mental health route now in schools instead of just a drug prevention program. Um, 
L-E-A-D is in most schools, high schools, middle schools and high schools in the state of Oklahoma. Northeast Oklahoma has Light of Hope, which takes that program, pairs it with a DEA agent, um, and really they're starting to take this video um, and they're more involved with getting the parents involved. So that's the big part and that's the big push that they're doing. We're working at the capital level to get things changed, um, but we need parents and people, professionals in the industry to back us up to make that um, important and part of their education. So yes, there are programs like that um, and we are working to get this in there as well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass this one off to Mark just a little bit. So, since our deputy, oh, he's back there. The potency that we're seeing in fentanyl now, one of these is not working to reverse an overdose. Each kit comes with two. And what we're seeing now, and Mark can attest to this, is sometimes you need more than one kit. They're using four, five, six of these to reverse an overdose on fentanyl. So, Mark. Can you talk to us just really briefly about that? And before you leave, make sure you get kids. Please, please, please. Uh, Karen, another announcement. If you need the community hours paperwork, see Dina Strickland in the back. She's at the table and she'll give you the certificate. Yes, or CEUs. Or CEUs. Yeah, I mean, and it's been mentioned several times, you're not exactly sure what you're getting. The, the idea is not to kill the clientele you're selling to, but a lot of these people got it from a guy who got it from a guy who got it from a guy who had it produced in a lab you know, in Southern California, and each time, uh, you know, it, it could be cut a different way and made either stronger or weaker, but uh, it can take sometimes just one pack, but it can take four packs, and sometimes we, we've had them where they just, they, every officer used every bit they had in the car, it made no difference at all, but they at least tried, and and so you, you're just not going to know. I mean, there's, as I talked about before, there, there's omafentanil, remafentanil, alfentanil, theofentanil. There's new versions that come up all the time, too. We were talking about the, what chemicals are in it. It's a very complex group of chemicals, but these people can buy them on the dark web. China has no shortage of them. They mass produce them, and then they, they move them on cargo ships. Some of them are selling them on the dark web, and we're literally intercepting thousands of pills in a, in a box this size that, that came from the, the post office this afternoon to an Oklahoma City apartment complex. I mean, it's, it's that ground level. It, it's, it, yeah, it starts out down in Mexico with the raw material from China and India, but the bottom line is some guy's on the dark web right now and he's probably getting a box to an, uh, an apartment here in Shawnee that could have 4,000 pills in it. Briefly, Narcan is naloxone as a nasal spray. Naloxone is actually the drug that reverses overdose. Narcan is the easiest I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to shove a needle into anyone's body when they're overdosing, personally. This is a lifesaver. It's literally up the nose, as you can attest to that. Um, it has an expiration date on the box. I have been told by many, many people, many professionals, that expiration date is required by the FDA. It does not expire. And if it was life or death, I'm going to use an expired Narcan. So that's the importance of it. I don't want to leave you here tonight without giving you resources. So if you have your phone, Oklahoma Harm Reduction, in partnership with Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, provides Narcan kits to you directly shipped to your front door. If you text naloxone, N-A-L-O-X-O-N-E, to 55155, they will ship it right to your front door. If you want it tonight, there are many booths out here that please take them. Please take them. Go ahead, Dr. Russ. And if it's not an overdose response because they're uh, unresponsive, no harm if you give it to them anyway. Absolutely. So don't. I could literally put it on my nose right now and it would have no effect on me whatsoever. It is not going to harm me. Anything else? I have one question. Go ahead. So, so the people that are that are involved in, in the distribution of CDS, distribution of a controlled substance that ends in the death of another person, uh, yeah, it, well, it, it probably depends on what jurisdiction that you're in, but 
the way the process, the, the elected prosecutor there, but that there can be absolutely dr uh, murder charges that are filed, manslaughter charges that are filed. There's maybe murder in the second degree. Uh, there's different ways that it can be charged. Uh, but um, yeah, so I, I don't know what's been your experience, but it's, uh, there are legal theories that are, if you can, if you got the evidence that it really shows this person was involved in that, um, you know, it's, you can, you can charge, uh, you can charge with a, at least second degree murder, no problem. Yeah, I was gonna say, we, we've got, uh, we've prosecuted, we being the state of Oklahoma, uh, 10 cases just since May of 2020 um, on individuals somewhere down in Altus, Ardmore, Oklahoma City, all of them got second degree murder. That, that seems to be the, more, the most consistent charge. And the sad thing, as I said before, it, it's oftentimes it was their boyfriend, girlfriend, or their, their high school best buddy that's getting charged with killing them because they provided the drug that killed them and they didn't have a clue that they were providing fentanyl. Yeah, but that, that group is in the hospital. There, there's another group that's facing legal charges and those are just friends. Uh, I was involved in a case in Texas where the fraternity brothers were charged simply because they failed to take the right action, call 911, and they just put the young man back in bed. So here are a dozen young men in college who now have legal histories. Yeah, if, if they the, didn't provide it, but they failed to do the right thing. Anything that could be, if the conduct could be described as reckless without disregard for someone's health and safety, the conduct, you, and it results in the death of the human, that's second degree murder. And so if you can just look at that, it's pretty reckless what they did, then that's, that's all it takes. Uh, first degree is intending to kill. You meant to kill somebody, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, you could be having people going to prison for it. I mean, they do. And just to touch base on that, um, Texas has actually just changed it from what we call an overdose to a fentanyl poisoning. And so we're working to get that language changed in Oklahoma as well, from an overdose to a fentanyl poisoning. Because the reality of it is, is these people, most of them, and some of them, are not knowing what they're ingesting, and that is a poisoning. So. Will you all please give our panel of professionals a round of applause? They volunteered their mics for us.